Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your grace may always precede and follow us that we may continually be given to good works. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Jeremiah encourages the Israelites in Diaspora with God's command to settle, 
to build lives and multiply even in captivity. Their faithfulness to the Lord in the midst of exile will result in blessing. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Alleluia, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are the deeds of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. His work is full of majesty and splendor, and his righteousness endures forever. He makes his marvelous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He gives food to those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the lands of the nations. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The works of his hands are faithfulness and justice. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He sent redemption to his people. He commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Those who act accordingly have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean, but the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Go where your best prayers take you, unclench the fists of your spirit and take it easy. Breathe deeply of the glad air and live one day at a time. Know that you are precious and learn to trust. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. As we sit here on this beautiful morning, our hearts and prayers and thoughts, of course, go out to all those up the eastern coastline through Haiti, the Bahamas, stretching on down, who have been affected by um, Hurricane Matthew. I know your hearts will not only reach out, but so will your dollars and ours too. So we lift them up this morning, knowing there are people without power and going through a lot of 
awful stuff as well as the struggle of um, the pain of losing people to the storm. So um, put that in perspective. Um, the ejection section is a little smaller today because it's uh, fall break week, so I always notice that. It's a little quieter, so it's all good, but I'm glad you're here this morning. I have a great story for you this morning. I heard a mom tell her daughter, who is five, was out riding her bike um, in the yard and kind of up and down the street. And she was in the kitchen watching her, making sure she was okay. Little girl's name is Joni. She's watching her. She has an older brother who is um, 10. His name is Joey. He was off. But anyway, so she's watching her daughter ride up and down. And she watched her ride down. And she kind of lost track. And then all of a sudden, she hears this blood-curdling scream. And she's crying. And, of course, the daughter runs into the kitchen. Mommy, Mommy, I was riding my bike. And Joey hit me. Dead quiet. She said, now look, Joey hit you while you were riding your bike? Yeah. Well, Johnny, that would be great, but it's not true because Joey's with your father at the grocery store and they left an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> Little girl stopped. She said, Mommy, does stuff like that happen all the time and it's nobody's fault? <laughs> and I'm not going to wear you out with that topic, but I don't need to tell you, do I? We are fault finders. My Lord, have mercy. That's what our society's become. We're eaten up with it. Blame and fault finding. Um, I could, I'm just not going to go there. <laughs> because I want to go to the positive side. How exciting, refreshing, powerful it is to have this story this morning. And I want you to go with me to the gospel because it's about this. You know, most of the time when people come up for Jesus, to Jesus for healing, the initial thing, most of the time in the Gospels is about why they are sick. Who sinned? Why did it happen? Who's at fault? Who's to blame? And this time you don't have any of it. Crystal clear, it's cut. Notice no conversation, no debate over why these lepers have leprosy. No, these poor people, the lowest of the low, the outcast of all outcasts need help. And it's clear cut. They simply come to Jesus to be healed, period. And you know what? That's where I find myself often. I bet you do too. We don't tell it because it's very painful. But I'm done with the talk. I am not joking. I'm done with the rationalizing, psychologizing, theologizing, politicizing, whatever it is. I just don't need any more of it. I just need some help. And I've been in those places, and I'll be there again. I need some healing, and I need it right now. I need some action. And guess what? That's what the story is. Jesus heals them. They don't even say anything. In fact, the only word Jesus speaks is, he says to these lepers now healed, go see the priest. Go and see the priest. Go show yourselves to the priest. Now, those words may not make sense to you, why he did it but it's, in their world, pretty important. Their leprosy may be gone and does go away. They are healed. But if they are to get their lives back, if they are to return to society, if they are to get their jobs back, if they are to get to go home again, they must be pronounced clean by the priest. The priest must say, you're well. And so they do, he does, and they are. Boom. Boom. But there's one more little thing about this story this morning that draws our attention. One more. There are 10 lepers who are healed, but only one. This one comes back to give thanks. He shouts praise. He gives gratitude. He's just full of this energy. And it is this person, Jesus says. He says about this one, your faith has made you well. Now, don't miss it. You've heard the opposite preach, and I'm not going to do that with you. It is not a put-down for the other nine. The other nine had faith, and it made them healed. But Jesus says about this one man, your faith has made you well. Well. You see, Jesus knows that there's a difference between being healed and being well, and we do too. I see it every day. I've seen it in my own life. See, Jesus knew it. Jesus heals a lot of people, but they are not really well afterward. 
I bet you have seen some of those. You might have been one of those. I have. But there are those who are not completely healed who are actually pretty well. And I see those people too. One of them right now is Jenny Rogers, one of our own. She's ill this morning at home, struggling with cancer. And yes, I'm saying her name out loud because she deserves it. She is a model for all of us. My gracious, is she full of gratitude and life. And I need those people to show me the way. That's why I come to church. I don't come here idly. Yeah, you pay me. Maybe I wouldn't come if you didn't pay me. I don't know. <laughs> don't try that, though. Let's not try that. But, you know, really, I do. I come because I am around that kind of inspiration. And that's what Jesus is pointing out. See, the thing that this healed leper shows all of us is this deep well of thanksgiving and gratitude. And I don't need to tell you, it's indisputable. Every bit of research says that people who are thankful and who can find gratitude live better lives, period, regardless of what they're facing, regardless of their circumstances. This summer and last summer, I got to meet this young man. His name is Ryan Brim. He came to town because he's a golfer. He's a professional, but he's on the small tour, the web.com that comes through here for the Knox Open. Some of you may go to the Knoxville Open. And a friend of mine is a friend of his parents, which is kind of fun. He's from Mount Pleasant, Michigan. And so to watch him play a couple of years has been really cool, and he's gotten better. And this year at the end of the web.com tour, if they make a certain amount of money and rank in a certain place, guess what happens? They get to move up to the big tour. So he won't be coming to Knoxville next year. He'll be playing for bigger dollars on the bigger stage. It's really exciting. Neat young man, great young man. But this is a great story. A couple of days after it was announced that he was going to move on up, he got a letter in the mail. Now, you may not know his name, but you know the name of the man who wrote him the letter. Because the letter said, thank you for all the work that you've put in. Thank you for actually giving yourself to this life. Because I think the golf game, the game of golf is important to the world and can teach and show so much. It's a great platform. It has changed my life. It will change your life. And I've never been unthankful. I've never missed the thanks that I have that I got to play golf. Do you know who the letter was from? Arnold Palmer. Handwritten. What touched me about that story is he died two days after this young man got that letter. It may have been the last letter he wrote. Not making that up. Very touching. You see, why could Arnold Palmer do that? He didn't have to. As it turns out, when we started doing exploration and this young man did, he did that to every golfer. He wrote letters constantly. You see, because deep inside him, he did have this wellspring of gratitude about what his life had been. He never got too rich or too important or too big in his britches or too self-made. He could have been all of those things. He would never went there. He lived a life of gratitude. It doesn't make him a saint bigger than other people, but it is significant that it's measurable. You can see it. You can see it in action. I don't know about you. I've known those people who write letters like that. Many of you remember with me Mrs. Forrest Andrews. You remember her? She wrote letters like that that were so touching. I received a couple. And other people did constantly. She was constantly writing letters to people to say, thank you for what you've done, noticing what they did, pointing it out, saying how much and how important their contribution had been. I'll tell you the other person who does it all the time is Jim Haslam. He's not here this morning, so he can't say I did it to aggrandize him. He may not even know we say that. Don't tell him. But he does. He writes letters all the time. We went down to do the burial for Sally Sanders, the wife of our former dean. A day later, I get a copy of the letter he has already handwritten to the priest at that parish to thank her for how wonderful her hospitality had been, how great the service had been. And I told him when I saw him, you continue to be a model of how I need to live. And I really meant that. You see, giving thanks, saying thanks comes not because we expect something in return. I promise you, you, that will not sustain you. It will not sustain you. If you're doing it for that reason, you're not doing it like me. I don't do it very well either. What will sustain you is to find deep inside this wellspring of gratitude that my life is overpouring with gratitude. 
You know, it's not an accident that Jesus said one. You notice the numbers, by the way. No, you didn't. I know that. They're there. He said one out of ten returned. You think he did that accidentally? No, no, it was a message. You see, he's Jewish. One out of ten, one-tenth is the tithe. He meant it. It's the truth. There's a concrete way, he's saying, that we show and express our gratitude with everything you got. Money, time, talent, energy, creativity, writing letters, giving thanks. What is it that you can do to make the world a better place and show that you are grateful to God for everything that you've been given? And he gives us this little coded piece right here in this story. A concrete way to live it out. Some of you know that I've mentioned Sonia Lubromiski several times in the past years. She is a research psychologist, she's brilliant. She studies wellness, happiness, really like her a great deal, like her writing. And um, she does work regularly with people who've been injured and often paralyzed in accidents. And she has groups, and it's interesting, she meets, so they, they start, they're going through the process of rehabilitation to whatever place they can be rehabilitated, and they have groups together, which is a brilliant thought. So they come together weekly, regularly to talk, to reflect how they're feeling, what they're thinking, what's going on inside, their emotional stuff. And she tells the story of a young college student named Brian who was in one of her groups recently. He had been severely injured in a car wreck. In fact, so severely injured that he could not walk, could barely do anything at first. He was in bed. So the rehabilitation started, and it was very, very difficult, very hard. And over time, through tough and exhausting um, painful work he made progress he got to the point that he could actually begin to use his arms lift his chest which may not sound anything to you but meant the world to him because what he was able to do is progress from that bed to a wheelchair from that wheelchair to a mobile wheelchair where he can use his hands and his upper body now to maneuver himself so they're in group and she asks them this question to the patients she says, so tell me, what's the happiest day of your life? What, what, tell me one. Well, they go around the room. They go around the group. Get to Brian, and Brian says, my happiest day is going to sound strange to y'all. It, it was really after I had my accident, was in the hospital. For months, I was in the hospital. He said it was the day I got to go home, and I drove my wheelchair up the new ramp into my house. He said, I can't tell you what happened. I got through that door, and he said, this surge of energy hit me. He said, I thought I could get up and walk. He said, I could not, but it felt like that. He said, I felt so powerful, and he said, I was defiant. And I started yelling, you did not win. I am alive. I am alive. I'm going to live. And then he said, I beat you. And he said, then when I thought about it, I was trying to figure out who I beat. <laughs> but you understand what was going on. He said, for the first time, I realized I was hopeful. I was going to have a future. I could go on. And I was home and so glad to be home. He said, Jesus is not playing games with us today. Gratitude and thanksgiving is lived in all kind of circumstances and needs to be. It's when we are 100% or when we're maybe 5%. See, that may be the key to all of this, to the starting over, the moving on, the having hope, the living life. The living life is getting with it. And gratitude is at the center of it all, Jesus says. You want to be healed? Okay. You want to be well? Find some deep gratitude. So how do we find it? Can you manufacture it? <laughs> how do you become someone like the people I've mentioned, the two or three this morning, who are clearly people who are not only gracious, they're full of gratitude. How do you do that? 
Well, I think there can be a little gratitude intervention, to be quite honest with you, and I've got a bit of homework for you. I want you to take some time, and don't flake out on me. Don't be a wiener. Don't quit listening. I'm serious. Really do this for yourself. I want you to think about the last week that you've lived, every one of you. Sit down, get away from the TV, turn the politics of sports off for a few minutes, get quiet, and just think for yourself, what has your last week been like? Just think. And then I want you to record five or six things for which you are thankful, for which really kind of almost surprisingly welled up in you about gratitude. Because you know what? They're there. They are there. It may take a little work. If they don't come, don't move. Sit still. You may have to come back and do it again. But I promise you, you write those down. And then, it's not magic. See how it makes you feel. I promise you, you're going to feel better. See, it helps you with what you see. I promise you, you will have a different perspective. And then see, maybe, just maybe, like the words that we sang in that wonderful hymn that Jason found for us, how our gratitude actually shapes and helps people around us. Because it will. Amen. Let us stand and reaffirm our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed, found on page 358. We believe in one God, the Father. Now we turn to the prayers of the people, Form 6, found on page 392. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For this community, the nation, and the world. For the just and proper use of your creation. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and George, our bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. 
for the special needs and concerns of this congregation. We pray especially for Patty Kane, Natalie Clark, Julia Clements, Wade Fry, Patricia Lenz Tway, Sharon McCoy, Don McGavin, Mary Price, Ann Robinson Craig, Jenny Rogers, Fred Rose, Francis Seiler, Jean Stuckey, Catherine White, Susan Wood, Sheila Akins, Scott Bertram, Ralph Copeland, Doug Fry, Quentin Henry, Chris Rains, Frank Rogers, and Kevin Schutte. Are there others? We pray for all of those afflicted by Hurricane Matthew. We pray for all who serve our country in the military, especially those deployed overseas. We pray for all victims of war, and we pray for all who are being persecuted and displaced because of their faith. Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. Especially today, we are thankful for those who serve our neighbors through the Volunteer Ministry Center. For the church, flowers in the church given to the glory of God and in honor of the marriage of Rabbi Jabur and Rania Adewil. And for the flowers in the chapel given to the glory of God and in memory of Ed Spolzer. Are there other thanksgivings? We will exalt you, O God, our King. We pray for all who have died that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. We pray especially today in remembrance of the American soldier who died this week, Adam S. Thomas. And we pray for Margot Saunders, Robin Conway, and Bud Albers. Are there others? Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins. Holy and gracious God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. Please, please be seated. progressed. As we've talked before, uh, they start off as probationers wearing just the red cassock, and then they first wear uh, the white ribbon and get their surplus at that time. Uh, and we have a couple that have made it to the light blue level. So I'd like for Rose, Hammond, and Bayless Bolt to come out here. So they've worked hard. Uh, they have exhibited knowledge of not only music, but the liturgy of the church and providing leadership in the choir. And so it's my honor to get to present them their light blue ribbons. So congratulations. Gratitude. 
walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right.
Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallelujah, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. next week uh, just take a look in here we got all kinds of things uh, uh, the journey's going on a hayride sounds fun nine spots left nine spots left okay and this is Chase Davenport she's going to tell you a little bit about the VMC race um, so there's a Dunkin Donut 5k or one mile fun run um, or fun walk rather that you could do it's Sunday October 30th um, at 2 30 at Hardin Valley Elementary School 
Uh, there's a couple different ways that you can participate. So you can either do the fun walk, which is great for families because um, it's a one mile that you get to eat donuts <laughs> and children get to um, dress in costumes if they choose. There's also a run, the three, um, 3.2 miles of 5K that you can do and you can also choose to eat donuts at that. Um, part of it you can compete <laughs> and eat donuts. I mean, it's a win-win, right? Um, there's also a way that you can support the VMC by being a couch supporter. So you can um, sign up and just donate money. Um, so any way that you choose to participate is, is very much appreciated. Um, you can either sign up online or there's these forms out there that you can pick up. It tells you exactly how to do it. Um, it's very easy and if you, when you do sign up, how, whatever option you choose, St. John's already has a team and so the biggest team also um, is really highly encouraged to, so everybody that is in St. John's can participate. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Chase. Well, now let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia.